Prosperity and all the Rick Berman groups, the Consumer Rights League won't say who funds them. Though they did admit a few months ago to Roll Call newspaper that they are at least in part funded by the financial industry. You're kidding. The board of directors of the Consumer Rights League, when they were founded, included the wife of the president of Freedom Works, who is a Republican fundraiser, uh, as well as a banking lobbyist. But now this group is hoping to confuse you. So they're hoping that if you go looking for that group, what was that group? CRL? CRL that had all that good information about Wall Street reform and payday lenders? They're hoping you might instead stumble on the other CRL, who's against Wall Street reform, who's all for payday lenders. And who, by the way, says those pinko commie pro-reform groups are all corrupt and horrible and don't believe them. As Wall Street reform really gets going now, watch for the corporate-funded fake activist groups and the right-wing media that loves them to really start screaming about this stuff throughout the echo chamber. Here's my favorite detail of this whole story. The former president of this fake group, the Consumer Rights League, Michael Flynn, want to know what he does now? He's the editor-in-chief of BigGovernment.com, the right-wing Andrew Breitbart website, which is eagerly promoting the protests against the real CRL. Michael Flynn also used to be a lobbyist, naturally, with Rick Berman, the guy who invented bamboozling schemes like this in the first place. So the next time some group you've never heard of before shares the same acronym as a well-known consumer group and seems to be pushing the exact opposite agenda as that group, don't be confused. Google them, and Google them good. These AstroTurf guys are pros. They think they can fool you. They think you're dumb. You're not dumb. They can't fool you. Not if you don't let them. We have confidence in the victory of good over evil fight the real enemy In 1992, the Irish artist Sinead O'Connor got even more famous than she already was at the time. That was on Saturday Night Live. As she concluded singing her own a cappella version of Bob Marley's protest song, War. As you saw there, she, she, she tore up a picture of Pope John Paul II live on TV. She said at the time that it was an effort to force a public discussion about the Catholic Church and child abuse. Remember, this was way back in 1992. She told Time magazine at the time, quote, In Ireland, we see our people are manifesting the highest incidence in Europe of child abuse. This is a direct result of the fact that in the schools, the priests have been beating the expletive out of the children for years and sexually abusing them. This is the example that's been set for the people of Ireland. They have been controlled by the church, the very people who authorized what was done to them, who gave permission for what was done to them. Now, almost 20 years later, of course, the Catholic Church is in the middle of a massive worldwide scandal involving not just sexual abuse of children by priests, but also revelations of deliberate, coordinated efforts within the church hierarchy to keep abuse secret and to resist punishing and removing priests who were abusing kids. John Paul II was pope in 2002 when the sex abuse scandal publicly exploded here in the U.S. He was criticized for leading the church hierarchy to be deliberately slow to act on abuse charges and to be systematically reluctant to expel abusive priests. Now, new allegations are surfacing, charging that the late pontiff or those in his inner circle obstructed an investigation into a Mexican priest who had both molested boys and fathered several children with different women. Also, that here his inner circle blocked an investigative commission from looking into an Austrian cardinal who allegedly abused an estimated 2,000 boys. The Vatican has an office in charge of handling abuse allegations. It's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. From November of 1981 until 2005, for more than 20 years, the man in charge of that office was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Cardinal Ratzinger only stopped being in charge of that office that handled sex abuse allegations at the Vatican. He only stopped having that job in 2005 because that was the year that he was elevated to Pope. He is now Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict himself now at the center of what's become an enormous second wave in the abuse and cover-up scandal. Thanks to investigative reporting by the New York Times and others, in recent weeks we've learned that in 1980, the man who is now Pope Benedict was copied on a memo telling him that a priest he had sent to therapy for pedophilia, quote, would be returned to pastoral work within days of beginning psychiatric treatment. Then Cardinal Ratzinger, now the Pope, had led a meeting approving that priest's transfer to once again work with kids. 
That priest was later convicted of molesting boys in another parish. We also know now that, thanks to a letter bearing his signature, that in 1985, the man who is now Pope resisted calls to expel a priest in California who had been criminally convicted of molesting children. Even as the priest himself and his bishop asked for the priest to be defrocked, Ratzinger resisted for years explaining that delaying kicking that man out of the priesthood would serve, quote, the good of the universal church. That man was ultimately convicted multiple times of multiple cases of child abuse, and he served years in prison. We've also recently learned in 1990, that in 1996, the man who's now pope opted not to defrock a Wisconsin priest who molested as many as 200 boys at a school for the deaf, despite the victims trying for years to raise the alarm about the abuse they suffered. The boys went so far in the 1970s as to put the priest's picture on a wanted poster and to hand out leaflets about him outside Milwaukee's cathedral. They got no support from the church. In Pope Benedict's home country of Germany, more than 300 victims of sexual abuse have come forward in this year. In March, Dutch bishops ordered an investigation into more than 200 allegations of sexual abuse of children by priests in that country. Two separate reports on abuse in Ireland came out last year. One chronicled decades of what it described as endemic rape and sexual and physical abuse in schools and institutions run by the Catholic Church in Ireland. The other report concluded that all archbishops in Ireland between 1975 and 2004, all were aware of at least some complaints and that the church hierarchy hid the abuse to protect the reputation of the church. Just yesterday, the Pope accepted the resignation of Bishop James Moriarty, who said he stepped down for never acting to change or challenge the church's policy of covering up sexual abuse by priests. He's the third Irish bishop to step down in the wake of these reports. Two other Irish bishops have offered to resign, but the Pope has not yet acted on those resignations. Today, a bishop in Belgium also resigned after admitting that he personally had abused a boy. Yesterday, a German bishop offered his resignation over allegations that he beat children. Earlier this month, it was revealed that a bishop in Norway who resigned last year did so after admitting to sexually abusing a boy when he was a priest as well. Last month, Pope Benedict issued a pastoral letter of apology to the Catholics of Ireland. The church took the extraordinary step of actually having the letter read aloud at Sunday Mass all over Ireland. Sinead O'Connor, for one, is not accepting the apology. In a Washington Post op-ed last month, she wrote this, quote, Benedict's, Benedict's apology states that his concern is, above all, to bring healing to the victims. Yet he denies them the one thing that might bring them healing, a full confession from the Vatican that it has covered up abuse and is now trying to cover up the cover-up. He suggests that Ireland's victims can find healing by getting close to the church, the same church that has demanded oaths of silence from molested children. As Ireland withstands Rome's offensive apology, I ask Americans to understand why an Irish Catholic woman who survived child abuse would want to rip up the Pope's picture, and whether Irish Catholics, because we dare not say we deserve better, should be treated as though we deserve less. Sinead O'Connor is the interview on this show tonight. We will hear from her next. Please stay with us.